The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Death's Bright Day, War's Dull Knife, and Bill's Cranky Lawnmower. The core values of lemon meringue pie makers. Plus, we begin our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. I'm Bain Editorial Assistant Christopher Rocchio. And I'm intern Rachel Mintel. So what's new this week, Tony? Well, we have an interview with David Drake this time. Uh, Dave discusses the latest book in his Republic of Cinnabar Navy series, a.k.a. the Leary and Mundy series, Death's Bright Day. As usual, Dave serves up some great stuff, including memories of the late great Jim Bain, and thoughts on which ancient historian he's going to ransack next for story ideas. And speaking of David Drake and the RCN series, this podcast marks the start of our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. Yes, it does. That's all coming up. Now here's the news. We want to note that the year's best military and adventure science fiction 2015 has now been disseminated like hearty rye seed to booksellers everywhere. This has some most excellent stories selected by editor David Afsharad, who is no stranger to this podcast. In fact, he's going to be doing some podcast hosting soon on the new Galactic Game short story anthology. But the thing about David's year's best anthology is that you, that is you listener, have a vote. Inside the book, the website is listed where you can vote on your favorite story in the volume. This doesn't get you anything directly, but the author with the winning story will receive $500 and a recognition award. Nice plaque at Dragon Con this year. That $500 will then go towards feeding Kith and Ken for the writer, so the author can produce even more great work for you to read. And the nice shiny plaque well, can be used as a shield to fend off knife-wielding burglars and then as a bludgeon to whack them over the head. So you see, by getting the collection, reading the story, and voting on the best, you may save a life and send a deserving criminal to prison after he gets over his concussion. Details on how to vote are in the front matter of the book. It does have some wonderful stories in it this year with great ideas, characters, and storytelling. Plus, it's got an introduction by David Weber himself. The year's best military and adventure science fiction 2015 is available at booksellers everywhere. I want to welcome David Drake once again to the podcast. Hi, Dave. Hi, Tony. Hi, Bane listeners. And we are getting more and more as the podcast goes on year after year. Uh, David Drake is the archetype of the archetypical Bane writer. We were trying to discuss what um, your your title might be. You called Jim uh, Bane God Emperor. Uh, God Emperor. Yeah. So we were. It, could it be somebody like Richelieu or uh, your title? Yeah, well, <laughs> Mazarin. Uh, but who uh, was the uh, who was the Gray Eminence? Um, I'm blocking on his. His name, though I, I've seen it, but yeah, think of me as, as just sort of a, a cleric in uh, Jim's friendship. It, you know, th this was really his company. Uh, it was never anybody else's company. But um, and you know, I I was Jim's friend, but I, I was not his partner or anything like that. But. Uh, we did chat, and I mean, he did chat with me, and uh, I heard about a lot of stuff before it actually happened, and including things like um, the uh, web scriptions, as it was then called, which is now Bain eBooks or something along those lines. So, um, but yeah, um, some sort of a cleric. Okay, but the main cleric. <laughs> The guy that whispers in the ear. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and then poison. No, wait, you're not Rasputin. We we ruled that out. No, yeah. no. Uh, but but we ruled it out simply because 
Jim was a hell of a lot more impressive than any of the Romanoffs were. Yeah. Well, Dave is also, and uh, perhaps because of this, the creator of numerous novels and series, including the best-selling Hammer's Slammers military science fiction series, and more recently, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy series. He's also the co-author on a host of series ranging from the Belisarius novels with Eric Flint to the Citizen series with John Lambshead and the General series with S.M. Sterling, Eric Flint, and me, Tony Daniel. The latest in the general series, by the way, would be The Heretic and the Savior by me and Dave. Dave is also the author of two high fantasy series, including the Lord of the Isles series and more recently the Book of the Elements series with um, latest. And you've wrapped that up, have you not, Dave? Yes. Yeah, both both of them are wrapped, correct. With Monsters of the Earth. He's also a prolific short story writer, and much of his early work is collected in recent Bane offerings, Night and Demons and his time travel-related stories in the collection Dinosaurs and a Dirigible. Dave is a graduate of Duke Law School. He's a Vietnam vet where he served in the 11th Cavalry uh, Black Horse Regiment. He also reads Latin for pleasure, Um, all related somehow in the the great stew of uh, wonder that you turn out. Now out from Bain at Booksellers Everywhere it's, is Death's Bright Day, the latest entry in the RCN series featuring Daniel Leary and Adele Monday as the main characters. Dave, you started Death's Bright Day with a wedding. Daniel Leary's getting married. Um, and throughout the series, he's been with a basically a bunch of bimbos, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that won't say a running joke, but yes, his, his taste in women is shallow. And um, goes for quantity rather than quality. Oh, well, certainly, rather than intellectual quality. He's, however, marrying a uh, an extremely intelligent uh, woman, and so this is definitely a change for him. And she is um, uh, Miranda Dorst, right? That's her name. of one of his midshipmen who was killed in action. Hang on just a second, Dave, if you would. I'm going to try to turn this off. I'm getting... Attractive little tinkling sounds. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully that will go away. Um, I think... My wife is trying to FaceTime me, but I told her I was doing a podcast, so she she should know my declines mean I'm on podcast. Okay, we'll cut all this out. Um, da, 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 da. We'll hope she knows. Yeah. Oh, I told her. Uh, so why is this wedding such a big deal for Cinnabar, um, for the Republic, as well as, you know, in Daniel uh, Leary's life? Uh, well, he's a war hero, and this means two things. Uh, one, that there's a lot of naval people who are, you know, really pleased at his good fortune. And the other thing is, because he is a war hero, there's a lot of important people who want to be seen with him. And so, um, and the fact that his family is very heavily politically connected, um, you know, adds to the guest list also. <laughs> so, uh, all of those reasons. So, why is, um, why is, since Daniel is completely connected to the political establishment, why is he so leery, as it were, of politics? Uh, well, for that reason, actually, he's seen it at the core and um, broke very thoroughly with his father, uh, nothing to do with politics, but basically he has gone in a deliberately different direction. Compete with his father, he does not associate with his father. Uh, he is focused on being his own man, and uh, at an emotional level, not just intellectual. Intellectually, this is a really good plan. But, uh, you know, 
know, it, emotionally, it's the only way he can live. He can't coexist, really, with his father if they're in the same milieu. Yeah, his his father's rather awful. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is, but he's very good at his job. Yeah. You know, if that meant saving the... Uh, the Republic at the cost of thousands of lives, many of them completely innocent. Uh, well, you know, that was the choice he was perfectly willing to make. Probably wouldn't have occurred to him to do otherwise. Um, I should uh, mention that we have a story at Bain.com going up. Uh, it will be up now uh, when this podcast uh, comes out. That is uh, a story that's set in Daniel Leary's early days at the at the academy and it in peripherally involves his relationship with his father but that's a great little story um what is cadet cruise is the title of that i believe and so you can find that at bain.com and eventually in the free nonfiction uh ebook that's available at bainebooks.com free nonfiction 2016 is where you can find it it's a really good way in also because it uh, a lot of the stuff that, that goes on in the series kind of, you seed it there in that story. It's, it was a fun read. That's what I was trying to do. Um, I, I, I'm not just trying to write a story. I mean, you know, I've, I've written a lot of short stories, and I, I'm good at it. But this particular one, I needed it to be something that somebody who's never read any of the RCN series could read and think, oh, well, that's an interesting story, but would give them a leg up rather than requiring knowing a bunch of stuff about the series before they read and liked the story. So, you know, it, it was an interesting test. <laughs> and we get the, 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 we get Daniel Leary being his, um, well, I'll obey authority when I'm pretty sure that's the right thing for me to do. Um, otherwise, I'll make things work out. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly right. So, um, one of the things, well, let's talk about Mundy, uh, Adele Mundy as well. Um, one of the things that's great about the series is how Larry and Mundy, how their friendship has grown without, it's not a, she's a woman, obviously, but there's not any sexual tension between them. And, but there's this, uh, this warm friendship. There are a lot of layers to it, but can you somewhat describe this relationship? Well, they're buddies. Uh, I based it on the Aubrey Matron series of um, walking on his name. <laughs> Patrick O'Brien. Yeah, uh, in which of two very different men, in that case, who are friends. Uh, but that's it. They're, they're friends, despite being quite different. Uh, and I thought, well, it really wouldn't matter with a friendship like that if they were of different genders. And so I consciously made one of them female. I decided to make the matter an equivalent female because of, you know, it was a kind of a toss up, but Dave Weber had um, Honor Harrington, and I didn't want it to look like I was playing off that. I wasn't. Uh, you know, Dave was more directly using the uh, Forrester's Hornblower series. I was using Patrick O'Brien's spin-off from, in effect, uh, he was hired to write a knockoff of the Hornblower series in the 50s when it got really big and did so, and because he was a very different man, uh, and different knowledge, uh, he wrote a very different series from what um, Forrester had written. Do you, um, I don't want to get too, uh, Sorry. <laughs> I don't want to get too delving into uh, your psychology and such, but um, do you think that being writing a friendship had uh, of two di very different people you could draw on your relationship with Jim Bain? Oh, hell yes. <laughs> yes, of course. 
course. Uh, although I'm not Ether Leary, I'm actually a lot closer to Mundy, to be honest. Uh, but Jim is neither of the two characters either. But it was it was that sort of we were utterly different people. We were equals in our different fields. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you bet. <laughs> Yeah. It's uh, it, it resonates with me. I, I my best friend is is completely different from me politically and socially. He's um he, he and he's uh an executive producer on TV shows and it it that sort of you'll do you don't agree on anything but you'll do anything for each other uh, really comes across with Larry and Mundy. Yes. And Adele works for the spy service. Um can you give us some of her background? She had a rather tragic childhood that had something to do with um, Larry's dad, I think. Well, that, that's it. As I say, um, Daniel's father was perfectly willing to kill thousands of people, many of them innocent, in order to uh, save the Republic. And uh, some of the people that he killed were all of Adele's relatives. And the parents, frankly, probably weren't innocent. But her 10-year-old sister certainly was, and, you know, her head got taken also, which is very much the way the prescriptions worked um, in the Roman Empire. You know, it's the reality of it, if you actually read the, the details. And uh, she's apolitical also, but uh, there's a very clear awareness of there, but for the grace of God, my head was up being displayed also. And she's got a sort of fatalism as a result. Yeah. <laughs> as I say, she's a lot like me. Yeah. And she wants to know things. Yeah. That's sort of her motivation. Um, and she's become a professional at it, I guess. How is she related to um, the uh, spy service at, and such? She's not an RCN officer yes. well actually she is she is okay an author well she's she is a warrant officer in the rcm uh, uh that is her formal position as a gentlewoman of cinnabar she does work with and for the spy service but it is emphasize throughout that there is nobody who can give her orders and ask her to do things, and she will probably do them, but she will do them because she chooses to do them. And, and this is it's an interesting character. This is not somebody who is cutting corners. Uh, this is literally someone with the option to pick and choose, and mostly they don't exercise that. Uh, you know, she doesn't. She does what she's asked to do, but she never has to. And her employer <laughs> is well aware that uh, she has to be asked to do something rather than ordered to do something. But when she decides to do it, she's rather ruthless. Utterly ruthless, yeah. yes. Uh, people tend to uh, conflate ruthlessness with cruelty. Uh, nothing of the sort. Ruthlessness means doing whatever is necessary. Cruelty means doing things because you take pleasure in doing them. Uh, and that's um, so-called Nazi medical uh, experiments. No, that was just pointless cruelty. Uh, there was never anything significant coming out of it. Uh, it was never intended to be. It was just, hey, we've got power, we can do things. Whereas Adele is, uh, well, you know, people are going to die as a result of this, but it is necessary, and uh, okay. Another a couple of favorite characters make their appearance in the book. I've always liked Hog, and uh, now Adele's got Tavera, 
um, or Tovera. Tovera. She at one point Tovera is asked um, what she would do if she were not assigned to the same ship as Mundy, and she said, "I suppose I'll waste away and die." Of course, this was a setup um, for them to to get aboard a ship, but um, and and they weren't going to be separated. But um, she's is she joking? Is that this uh, has this become a uh, symbiotic relationship at this point? Uh, it's symbiotic, but she wouldn't waste away and die. She would do something really horrendous. Yeah. So Adele is sort of her conscience. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And she, she, Tavera is a sociopath. Uh, she realizes that her her actions will get her killed. She has no conscience of her own. She is deliberately and clearly uh, attaching herself to Adele because Adele is close enough to the mindset that she can understand, but also is enough of a normal human being to have a conscience. That doesn't mean she won't do things, but she will not do anything or permit Tavera to do anything that will not be socially acceptable with luck. So, you know, Tavera is to Adele much as Adele's pistol is to Adele. Mm -hmm. Uh, A tool, and in Tavera's case, a willing tool. And a very competent one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she was trained as an assassin by the uh, bad guys, um, (laughs) the equivalent of the KGB. There's a great scene in the book um, where uh, it's it's rather complicated, but... um, Daniel is ordering one of his uh, one of his young officers to um, possibly shoot another captain if they get out of line um, and start going rogue. And Adele just um, and uh, Tavares says, "Well, you, that gun's not going to work. Here's the one that'll really blow him away if you have to shoot him." You're you're a crap pistol shot. Use uh, this, <laughs> and hands her a submachine gun. Yes. So she's good at that. Um, and Hog is sort of like this. Uh... Hog is a countryman. Yeah, uh, he's got a huge personality. Um, I don't know. How would you describe him? You, he's a countryman. In what way? He's from Bantry. Yeah, he he's uh, he was literally a, a poacher on Daniel's estate. Uh, he became a surrogate father for Daniel and reacts to Daniel as, um, you know, a surrogate son. But, um, as <coughs> he, he is ruthless in a fashion. You know, Tavera is simply a, a sociopath. Uh Hog, it, it's a much simpler sort of thing. Uh, there's us and them. And uh, us <laughs> at the absolute down at the core, that's the young master. And anybody else is disposable. Yeah. And it's, if Daniel wants to hit somebody, it seems like Hog will do it for him <laughs> in some way. Like. Fair enough, although, you know, Daniel is perfectly willing to take care of himself, but yes. And also returning are some of the, um, some of the great characters on the, the sissy crew, um, the Princess Cecile. Uh, There are two big sharks in the political universe uh, of the RCN series, the Republic of Cinnabar and the, the Alliance, uh, can't remember their full name. Alliance of Free Stars. (laughs) And they were at war for quite some time, um, which comprises most of the series. But now peace has come, and this situation has, ar- has arisen at a sort of a backwater called Tarbell Stars. Um, can you lay out what's going on here in the book, the power dynamics and such? Yes. Um, 
you you may be aware that Russia actually conquered Asia, uh, particularly Central Asia, against the orders of the Tsars. Uh, it was a case that generals out on the periphery knew that if they conquered uh, the next tribe over, uh, they would be promoted. If they failed, of course, they'd you know, be hacked. But uh, hmm. if you wanted promotion, you really had to become a military hero and conquer somebody. And this was really bad for Russia because it was already overstretched, and you're talking about conquering Caucasian tribes, which are about as... <laughs> Take a look at what's coming out of the Caucasian republics now, and, you know, we, we are talking about places like Chechnya, and, and at the time it was happening, in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, they were no more useful to Russia than they are now. And nonetheless, it kept happening because the, the real dynamics were you could not sack a, a successful general. And that's what's going on in the Tar Belt Stars. One of the high-placed officials actually in the Secret Service of the alliance is trying to foment a takeover. This in itself wouldn't be a huge problem, except it would change the dynamics of the peace between Cinnabar and the alliance. The peace is dependent on neither party um, expanding its empire. And um, therefore, <laughs> whatever the head of the alliance, the Garanthor, really thinks about it, no one's really quite sure how much he knows and you know what he believes. Um, it's going to mean a return to war, and. The peace is not one of fellowship, it's a peace of exhaustion. Both sides were completely fought out. Uh, Cinnabar was facing internal collapse, so was the alliance. And that is why there is peace. Uh, another war will bring up mutual collapse. So you have other administrators on both sides whose main focus is to keep the peace. And that means blocking the attempt of this high-ranking uh, alliance official from being successful, not, not because anybody really cares about the Tarbell stars, but because it's going to mean war. So that is why people on both sides are uh, trying to get Daniel and Adele to frustrate the attempt to conquer this cluster. Yeah. But know. he can't be sent in an official RCN capacity, though, because that would make... Uh, the would be worse. I mean, that would be exactly the, uh, that in itself would be a cause for war. But, you know, as a privateer, as a mercenary, and there are plenty of mercenaries on both sides uh, in the, the rebellion going on in the Tar Belt Stars now, um, well, it's just one more small ship and a couple more officers. I, I'm using a situation not dissimilar to that of the uh, period around 200 B.C. in the Greek world, 
where you had the successor empires to the the successors to uh, Alexander the Great. Um, they were coming to the end of their lines because Rome was sort of accidentally expanding into the Greek world. And again, the, the expansion was very much like that of Russia in the 19th century. It, it was not a planned expansion, and it wound up completely destroying the, uh, the Roman Republic uh, in a, a variety of fashions. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, that that's a historical background on that. Yeah. So the basically Daniel's got to got to keep this um revolution that the alliance is fomenting against themselves basically uh, or against two factions are fighting. He's got to keep it from from sparking into war again. It's going to make everyone miserable. But throughout the uh, book it's really it's really fun when Adele and Daniel impress on the local officials how <laughs> meaningless their lives really are if they weren't in this particular situation. Oh, yes. <laughs> so the on the way, um, Daniel takes a honeymoon with Miranda, and they go to this, uh, they, have, they have like a, this little mini adventure, and I really loved your description of these caves. Um, what... Uh, where do they go? What is this place? And they almost get, you know, uh, left down there forever. It, um, it it's a description or of some. Well, it is based on a situation in um, real caves in Jamaica, uh, but made science fictional. Uh, basically, you have a cave in which microorganisms on the walls um, not only give light, but move slowly and eat sulfur. And uh, the, the other aspect is uh, a beehive. You may be aware that uh, bees will coat uh, intruders, you know, mouse, for example, with a uh, protective material that will actually embalm them. Um, and, you know, I, I played off those things with some South American politics, basically, uh, 19th century South American politics. And, I, you know, I, I use historical sources when I can, and, and I did there. Well, let me backtrack, because another beautiful and dangerous space you have in the books is The Matrix. Um, can you tell us about how FTL supposedly works in the series and, and what The Matrix... Um, your descriptions of it are really, a, are really pretty, although it's dangerous out there. <laughs> Much like the ocean. Yes, um... Yeah, well, first thing to say about that is I was a history and Latin major. So if you're expecting physics from me, uh, you're going to be really disappointed. Well, you do some pretty good uh, pseudoscientific bullshitting, I thought. Oh, yes. yes. But, but I do want to emphasize that, you know, when Larry Niven wrote Ringworld, he had huge numbers of engineers writing him to tell him why it wouldn't work and in giving him long equations, and he cared about that. And, well, he was right, I suppose, to care about it, but I would be willing to argue that Ringworld, the original, mm. is a wonderful book, is also the last really good book that Larry wrote. I guess, like, yeah, I mean, you don't have to agree with my opinion, but um, 
I, I've seen too many cases where writers get caught up in the the reality of well, you've got to tweak this. Uh, you you've got to make the timeline different here. No, I don't. I'm writing stories. I'm telling stories. However, uh, the I, I think we can all pretty well agree that there's no practical way of exceeding the speed of light in this universe, and probably not any other universe either. However, other universes may well have different constants, including that of light speed. And so by transferring between universes and conserving momentum, uh, you can physically get from one point to another because of different constants of space and time. You can get from one point to another in the real world, in the sidereal universe, the starry universe, uh, in less time than it would take if you made your entire journey in the sidereal universe. And um, so that's what I play off. And well, how do you get between them? Well, you know, the one thing that seems to be a constant everywhere, I mean, in the cosmos, is Casimir radiation. No one's really quite sure what it is or where it comes from. God knows. But um, I have the use of Casimir radiation nudging sailing ships, if you will, uh, from one universe to another. And I don't claim it's true, but I try to keep it self-consistent. And um, it makes for the kind of stories that I like to tell. When you're standing outside, you can see these various universes. Yes, yes. And the energy levels uh, affect the apparent colors, although these are probably um, things created in your brain rather than absolute colors. Uh, you know, much the way, you know, the, the optic nerve reverses the lens, reverses images that you see, mm -hmm. but your brain then reconverts it into normal upright uh, images. And, you know, I'm assuming that the color is actually false color, but there's no way you can prove it. So, but yes, you, you have a very colorful mass of glowing island universes of uh, viewed. You're not seeing space from outside a ship, you're seeing the cosmos, all space is. Um, I don't know. It, I wanted to get some of the wonder that O'Brien puts in his descriptions of a sailing ship, someone who loves sailing and loves ships and knows them. Mm -hmm. I, I tried to, to get that into my books as well, because I think that's an important part of the Aubrey Matterin series. Yeah. Well, it really, it really works. I love the, uh, the Matrix uh, descriptions, and uh, Miranda gets to see it for the first time, I guess, or gets to go outside mm -hmm. in this one. What? Um, so we don't want to get too much into what happens, uh, obviously, but what... Good guys win. I mean, if you want to call that a spoiler. <laughs> okay. And, well, how does, all right, so Larry ends up using a, using, uh, a bunch of sailors and Marines for, for, uh, some combat he needs to do. Um, and he uses, uh, what's the method he uses to train them? Cause it's, a uh, it, tossing them into the deep end. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, that, that's basically it. Um, he, uh, makes everybody in the 
existing military forces, which are third world at best. Um, he makes them all grunts and says, you know, okay, you're serving under my personnel who are trained to my standards. Uh, they are your officers. You will do as they say or you're out. And it, if you've got good people and they've got good, if they've got instructors who are actually good themselves, then they will learn by example and by taking orders. And if they're not good, uh, well, it's a, it's a total lost system. I mean, if they don't make the grade, they're out. And he doesn't really care what the retention rate is. Yeah, there's not much mollycoddling going on. Oh, it's, and I mean, there's you know, there's some great scenes of of the of kicking the jerks out <laughs> as well. Well, yes. <laughs> you know, the quicker you take care of that, the better everyone is. Which brings me to um, uh, the Charles Platt <laughs> character in the book. Um, you seem to have a guy named this in everything that has to do with the RCN series. Yeah, I do. Um, it, it didn't seem like something as horrible as usually happens to him happened here, though. Uh, or maybe it did. Um but you're not getting soft on your on your Charlie. Platt, oh no, right? no, I'm not. It, uh, basically, the Platts don't necessarily die. They are just shown to be despicable, sniveling nobodies, uh -huh. it, and, and that is consistent. You have one in the uh, in Cadet Cruise uh, as well. <laughs> yes, I did. I like that guy. <laughs> that was a good <laughs> villain or jerk antagonist. Um, uh, basically, uh, I guess he might be eaten by the natives at the end. We're just not sure. Exactly. Okay. And, you know, as, as uh, Larry says, well, <laughs> not really my problem as long as he's off my shit. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's a big space battle in here. Um, in, in general, how does space battles work? In, uh, in in this story and in the RCN universe? What kind of vessel is the is the Princess Cecile? Uh, Princess Cecile is a Corvette. She is a, a very light, standard naval vessel. Um, she mounts light armament. Uh, she is a full naval vessel. She is designed and built to naval standards, which are quite different from civilian standards, but she's extremely small, and she's uh, operating in a universe in which uh, a battleship may run up to 100,000 tons, and she weighs 1,300 tons. And uh, so she, she is not... <sighs> the major difference is the, um, the main armament are missiles, kinetic energy missiles. And they um, get up to a, a significant fraction of light speed, which is why they don't have warheads. Um, but they are kinetic energy. And um, she can launch two at a time a battleship may be able to launch 80 or 100 at a time. And the different, the, the main way to avoid being destroyed is to dodge. And if you're firing two at a time, the enemy can pretty easily dodge. If you're firing 100 in a massive, overwhelming sweep, uh, that's harder to dodge. Why has Larry, um, I mean, presumably at this point, he could probably get a command like a battleship if he wanted. Um, why has he stayed with the Cecile? Uh, freedom of action. The, the problem with a battleship isn't just, even if you're the commander, you've got a lot. 
got a lot of people under you, and they will take your orders, but you've got a lot of people over you, and you can't just go herring off on your own. And Daniel has the clout and the skills to get away with doing stuff on his own. And that's one thing if you're, you've got a Corvette under you, and indeed you, you own the Corvette, even if it's rented back to the Navy for the moment. But you can't do that with a battleship. And um, you can't do that with a squadron. So, And the commander of a squadron cannot decide he wants to spend some time doing something interesting on his own. Uh, no, he's got a squadron to command. So both for my story purposes, but realistically, because Daniel has the choice, He's not particularly interested in rank. He's not particularly interested. He is a leader, and he leads, but he's not interested in giving orders. Just, you know. Yeah. Well, he's created something like a, a rough family. Yes. Yeah. On the ship. And Adele's kind of the... <laughs> Very dangerous mama. <laughs> well, th th think of her as the crazy aunt. Uh -huh. <laughs> Who, instead of standing on the, the street corner and uh, haranguing pedestrians, is actually sitting very quietly, but is likely to shoot you. Mm -hmm. And knows everything about you. Well, um, you know, I know a bit, I've encountered a few David Drake outlines in my time now. Um, how do you outline uh, an RCN book? Do you have a general process for conceiving and writing a Larry and, and Mundy novel? What's your process, I guess, is the question. Well, um, with, with the, the RCN series, I almost always start by reading a classical historian. And I think um, I think this one came from uh, Livy. Yeah, as I say, the uh, the books dealing with the uh, run up with the war against uh, Antiochus the Great uh, around 200 BC, and I take a lot of I I pray see the the history of the, you know, that period. And if something strikes me, you know, oh, that's interesting. Uh, I remember one of them I got because um, I ran into what was actually a passing reference of a, um, the Gauls of northern Italy rebelled against um, Roman hegemony uh, after the uh, conclusion of the Second Punic War. And their leader or was or was believed to have been a Carthaginian officer who'd escaped from the general... Um, massacre of a couple of Carthaginian armies that had been defeated before Hannibal left Italy. Uh, you know, there were reinforcements sent to him and were defeated. And uh, it, it was believed at the time that one of those uh, officers had organized the, Gaul, the, uh, well, the Gauls into a much more sophisticated um, fighting and strategic force than they had ever been before. And I thought, you know, that's interesting. Uh, the first thing the Romans did about it was uh, protest to Carthage, whom they defeated. And the Carthaginians were responsible 
for uh, disarming solar troops in uh, Roman areas. So <laughs> they were being ordered to put down this Gallic rebellion or to, to repatriate their citizen. I thought, geez, I wonder what the guy who got that job, you know, sent by the Carthaginian Senate to northern Italy, I wonder what life was like for him. And that that became the uh, the basis of um, one of the recent Arsican yeah. books. <clears throat> Well, an extremely competent officer stuck out on his own and and uh, creating a fighting force. Um, that's kind of the it's it's somewhat of the heart of this book. Um, it, what uh, what's it up next for Larry and Mundy? Well, at the end of this one, I've set up a. Uh, an action that will involve the entire RCN, or at least a significant portion of it. And um, Leary and Mundy will have something to do with it, although I haven't started reading Dio or Dionysius or Livy with this particular thing in mind, but that will be the next. In effect, the um, the reduction of Syracuse after the death of Hieronymus. Uh, <laughs> so you have to. So there's various historians who chronicled it, and you're going to you're going to pick out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I do want to focus on a, a more personal rather than strategic. Um, story. Um, I'll read the original sources and see what personal stories strike me as, okay, I can do something with that. And, you know, I will. Cool. So, um, what are you working on right now? Oh. <laughs> you said you were, I interrupted you during your massacre. Um, well, yeah, uh, I called you. <laughs> but don't worry, they'll they'll be dead. Um, I'm doing a science fictional matter of Britain, if you're familiar with the term. Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table as space opera. Is that going to be for us, or, or is it? Oh, that's Tor. That's Tor, okay. Well, damn it. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, they may turn it down. Yeah. As a matter of fact, in the course of the negotiations, which were very protracted, uh, it did occur to me that, oh, hell, I can just phone Tony and see if she wants this for one of my open contracts. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure she'd mm -hmm. say yes, and I won't have all this running about stupid bureaucracy yeah well we, it's really good for to have a negotiation fallback position like tony <laughs> yes it is so. and i've never forgotten it and I, I might add that tony is really quite a a sensible person uh jim had a personality the way i had a personality and one of the reasons we stayed friends all the time we did was I never had to say, look, you push too hard and I'll just go over to Tor. Because he knew it. <laughs> I didn't mm -hmm. have to tell him that. Yeah. It just made it a lot easier for the two of us to, to deal. And now that Tor has gotten bureaucratized, um, I am very glad to have that the other way. Uh -huh. Well, we're the opposite of bureaucracy around here. Well, I, look, at the time I started with Jim Bain, actually I started with him at Ace, but when Tom and he founded Tor, 
in 1981. Um, I was one of the authors who went with me, went with them. And uh, I remember when it was Tom and Jim and Tom's wife who did the accounts and a secretary and I guess a couple of assistants. And Harriet McDougall was doing non-SF stuff uh, from Charleston, South Carolina. So Tor was not very bureaucratized then either, and I liked that. Yeah, well, we've we've come a long way, baby, all of us. The well, the book is Desperate Day by David Drake. It's the latest entry in the RCN series, and it's available now at booksellers everywhere. Dave, thanks really. Thank you so much for being with us again. Well, it's it's a pleasure. You ask questions that make me think. And uh, frequently, I don't really know what I think until I hear myself say it, which is interesting. <laughs> You're getting the real me. Well, it'll be really cool to see which historian you uh, <laughs> you go to for the next one. <laughs> right easy, Tony. Okay. Now we begin our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend the cyberspy Adele Mundy. The only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Corsera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the first entry in David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. Audible Studios presents The Sea Without a Shore Written by David Drake Narrated by Victor Bavine Chapter 1 Bantry Estate Cinnabar Daniel Leary Otherwise, Captain Daniel Oliver Leary, Republic of Cinnabar Navy, but here merely Master Daniel or Squire, stood poised in the bow of the skiff with his arms at his sides. The throwing stick was in his right hand with the line knocked in the cleft and the lure dangling. Hogg knelt in the stern, holding the tiller throttle of the tiny motor that edged the boat toward the floating weed. The lure was a streamlined tube about the size of a plump man's middle finger. Its batteries powered the caged contra-rotating props, but control signals came down the line from the handset now resting on the planks in front of Hogg. When the lure hit the water, it would circle until it picked up the pattern of electrical impulses given off by the nerves of the species it was set for, then home on that source. It was set now for floor fish, Two or three sprats would fill it into an excellent dinner for Daniel and Miranda, his fiancée, who was waiting in the manor. Daniel tensed to make the cast. Don't get ahead of yourself, boy, Hogg said. Another ten feet, and don't tell me your arm's strong enough to cast into the center from here. The skiff continued to creep toward the weed. Hogg spoke quietly so as not to disturb the prey, but his voice was as harsh as a rough-cut file. Here off the coast of the Bantry estate, their relationship was the same as it had been twenty years earlier, when the old poacher took it on himself to teach the young master how to fish and to hunt, and how to be a man. Teaching Daniel to be a man wasn't part of a plan, but Hogg was a man himself and made assumptions. If he'd been asked, he would have said that Corder Leary wanted a son who would stand up for himself, who would carry out his duties, and he would take responsibility for his own actions. Overhead, a trio of barranca birds sailed southward, 
following the cold current which had been bent toward shore during the volcanic eruptions hundreds of miles out in the Western Ocean. The birds were so high that even Daniel's sharp eyes couldn't distinguish the two separate pairs of wings on each. The occasional low-frequency grunts of the birds communicating were barely audible, even to ears trained to recognize them. Looking back on his childhood, Daniel suspected that his father had been too busy chasing money and power to spare any thoughts for the boy who lived with his mother on the Bantry estate. Still, Speaker Leary wouldn't have minded what Daniel was learning any more than he would have cared about the weather over Bantry while he was comfortable in the Leary townhouse in the capital, Zenos. Hogg switched off the motor. It was inaudible even while it was running, but Daniel had felt the vibration through the thin soles of his moccasins. The skiff drifted forward on momentum. Daniel swung his right arm up in parallel with the keel. At the height of its arc, his fingers released the line which he'd clamped to the throwing stick till that moment. The lure sailed off in a flat curve that plopped it into the center of the large patch of weed. A nice cast, said Hogg softly. You haven't forgotten everything I taught you, I guess. I haven't forgotten not to draw an inside straight either, Daniel said. He remained upright for a better view, though standing in the small boat would have been dangerous despite the skiff's broad bottom if the water hadn't been still and Daniel's own balance perfect. The skills he'd gained as a boy on Bantry had been sharpened since he'd entered the Naval Academy and began running along the spars of starships. Instead of circling as expected, the lure vanished instantly. It looks like it just sank, Daniel said, squinting. He had a pair of multifunction RCN goggles on his forehead, but they wouldn't help him look through the water. Do you suppose the motor failed? The motor's running fine, and the props are free, Hogg said testily, looking at the readout on his control unit. It's just got a bite. Unless... Hogg's delay was too short to have allowed Daniel to speak even if he'd intended to. That bloody weed has caught it. It's the deep seaweed with thicker hair, but the lure seems okay. He and Daniel were in the channel between Borden's Key and the mainland, but recent Norwesters had brought considerable oceanic debris through the inlets, including unfamiliar fish parboiled by the volcano. This patch of weed looked from any distance like the normal inshore variety. But as Hogg had said, it was the open water species whose clumps were tied together by tendrils sturdy enough to withstand serious storms. Want to haul back the lure and try near the creek mouth? Daniel said, frowning. He was closer to the weed. He could have noticed before Hogg did that it was slightly darker than it should have been. But Hogg had spent most of his 60 years learning the tricks and whims of nature on the Bantry estate. Missing something that Hogg also had missed wasn't a good reason to kick himself. It's still running true, Hogg said. So don't get in front of yourself. Maybe we're just having fisherman's luck. Hogg had been concentrating on the holographic readout hovering above the control unit. His fierceness suggested he was planning to take a bite out of the display. A brief smile turned his unshaven face into something remarkably ugly. Daniel smiled also. Like Hogg, he was used to having luck when he was fishing. Most of it was bad. The channel wasn't much over a quarter mile wide here. Similar vegetation grew on both the quay and the mainland. But the trees on the mainland shore were taller, and they were much taller farther inland, where storms less often drove salt water over the roots. Birds shrieked and clucked, but they remained hidden in the foliage. Insect eaters wouldn't be out in numbers until nightfall, but Daniel was surprised not to see the fish eaters, which were usually snatching meals from the surface of the water or gorging on carrion on the mud. A skiff with two fishermen wasn't reason to frighten them under cover. We've got one, Hogg said, adjusting both thumb controls of the handset. We bloody have got one. The lure was multifunction. When it was attached, the controller sent impulses into the nervous system of a fish. You couldn't actually control the behavior even of a fish, but a disruption equivalent to an unscratchable itch would eventually bring the prey thrashing to the surface as it tried to rid itself of the irritation. Daniel set the throwing stick down on the floorboards. 
He touched the trident with hooked barbs of spring steel, then thought again. The pole was only six feet long. That was as much as they wanted to carry in so small a boat, but it wasn't enough to reach the center of the weed from where they now floated. I'll go in, he said. He didn't want to foul the lure's prop in heavy weed. Hogg grunted agreement, still concentrating on the controller. Sitting down, Daniel pulled off his moccasins. He probably ought to take off his baggy trousers also, but sometimes small crustaceans clung to floating weed, and he didn't want to transfer them to his wedding tackle. As he started to his feet again, the skiff rocked violently. Bloody hell and damnation, Hogg said, looking up from the display but not dropping the controller. Daniel's first thought was that there had been another subsea earthquake, a tremor like those which the volcano had spawned in recent months. The weed lifted in a great swell. Instead of subsiding, it hung in streamers on the dark, twitching mass which floated on the surface of the water. On my sainted mother's soul, Hogg said in a tone of reverence, we've got an adult. What's it doing here? Daniel had heard enough stories growing up on Bantry, some of them from Hogg himself, to know that if Hogg's mother had been a saint, it was only by comparison with Hogg's father. That aside, there was no doubt that they'd caught an adult floor fish. If caught was the right word. The volcano must have brought it up, Daniel said. Adult floor fish meandered across the bottom at 3,000 feet or deeper. Though their eggs hatched in marshes, and the sprats spent their first two years in coastal waters. It's sixty feet long if it's an inch. And the flesh is no good for anything but feeding pigs, Hogg said with a tone of regret. Even if we could land it. He adjusted his controller again. The floor fish continued to quiver, so Daniel didn't rise from his knees. There wasn't any real risk. When Hogg released the lure, the fish... It was really a blanket with a mouth at one end and a body filled by the gut which processed ooze that the mouth sucked in, would sink back to the bottom. Daniel grinned. The worst danger that the floor fish posed was that if it didn't find its way back out to sea soon, the warmth and higher oxygen content of the surface waters would probably kill it. In that case, its many tons of rotting flesh and partially digested ooze would make a considerable area uninhabitable until the process was complete. Fortunately, nobody except hunters and sport fishermen spent much time in this swampy portion of Bantry. The fish continued to wobble like a huge jelly while Hogg stabbed at his controller. It won't release, he snarled. I don't know if it's something corroded or the probes are just too deep in that thick hide. He stuck his hand into a baggy pocket and brought out a folding knife with a knuckle duster hilt. The blade snicked open. I say we cut the line and chalk it up to experience. Do you have another lure? Daniel said. Hogg shrugged. Back to the manor, he said. We've got three sprats now in the coal chest. That's enough for dinner. And if it's not, well, me and M, that would be the widow Bryce, can find something else. She's not big on fish anyhow. That was all true, but... I'll fetch the lure, Daniel said, swinging his right foot into the water carefully. I was figuring to go in with the trident anyway. He eased over the side by stages, gripping the gunwale with both hands and lowering himself carefully to reduce the splash. The water was noticeably warm, more sign of the volcanic disruption, he supposed. Hogg had leaned to his left instinctively to balance Daniel's weight. I can't turn off the current, or the fish will go right back to the bottom, he said. That means it's going to keep on shivering like that. Right, said Daniel, breast stroking away from the skiff with his head out of the water. Well, if it swallows me, you can cut me out with that knife of yours. The weed wasn't as thick as it looked from even a short distance away. The tendrils which bound palm-sized clumps into mats the size of a soccer pitch parted as easily as gauze between Daniel's hands. He wouldn't want to swim miles through the weed, but he thought he could if he had to. Twenty yards was no problem. The line of optical fiber was invisible, except that when the sun caught it at the right angle, it became a slash of light from the water to the lure on the black-brown skin. 
Daniel was probably brushing it as he swam, paddled toward the floor fish, but its touch went unnoticed in the weed. The floor fish had a fringe of fins all along its side. They extended about the length of Daniel's forearm and were stiffened with cartilage, not spines. They appeared to undulate gently, but there was enough power behind the continuous motion to push at Daniel like a strong current when he was close enough to touch the fish. Daniel paused, then dived and came up like a sprat trying to escape a predator. His outstretched hand gripped the lure, and his weight pulled it free as he slid down the slimy side of the floor fish. Master, Hogg shouted, back away. Keep the bloody lure on your bare skin and in the water between you, okay? Don't bloody argue. Between wasn't a direction, but Hogg must mean the floor fish if he wanted Daniel to back away. The older man's voice wasn't panicked, but there was more stress in it than Daniel remembered since the night Hogg had readied the Bantry tenants against trouble that might sweep in from the darkness. He'd handed the seven-year-old Daniel Leary a shotgun and told him to aim for heads because face shields weren't as tough as the body armor which the attackers might be wearing. No one came to Bantry that night. In the morning, Daniel and the others learned that Speaker Leary had drowned the Three Circles conspiracy in blood, wiping out the leaders of the popular party and their families, save for a few of the proscribed who happened to be off-planet at the time the crisis broke. One of those survivors was Adele Mundy, 16-year-old daughter of Lucius Mundy, the leader of the popular party. She had just left to study in the academic collections on Blythe. At the time, Adele's name wouldn't have meant anything to Daniel, or for that matter to Quarter Leary. The girl was a scholar and wholly apolitical. Daniel, a newly made lieutenant, had met Adele, then electoral librarian on Kostrama five years ago. That meeting had changed their lives. Both of them were better off by orders of magnitude than they would have been without the other's support. That was the opening segment in our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to Christopher Rocchio, Rachel Mantel, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a volley of flaming pencils shot from tiny bows made of iPhone crankshafts and alternator belts into the upper ramparts of the castle of storytelling excellence, plus fireworks and gratitude to David Drake author of the new RCN entry, Death's Bright Day. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars.